So I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's Molecular Medicine Lecture. Um, I'm Ray Monnet. I'm a faculty member and professor in two departments in the School of Medicine, the Department of Pathology and the Department of Genome Sciences. And it's my pleasure and it's a privilege to welcome all of you tonight to this lecture series. This lecture series is sponsored by the Molecular Medicine Program. And it's a lecture series in which uh, we had the idea of trying to bring some of the excitement at the interface between biology and medicine that's occurring on this campus to the community and especially to students, both high school students and to university and other students who participate in this lecture series. And as a result, I'm delighted to see the representation of students in the room in addition uh, to other members of the community. This program and the lecture series uh, is sponsored by the Molecular Medicine Program. This is a new interdisciplinary training program that at the moment is designed to augment PhD training in the biomedical sciences. It was started with the Department of Medicine faculty and faculty of eight participating departments in the School of Medicine. And we started this with a, uh, an initial starter grant from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in their Med into Grad program that had as a specific aim providing more about clinical medicine in the context of biomedical science PhD training. Um, I should mention, I neglected to mention before, all of the lectures in this series are available or will be available on UW television. If you'd like to go back and look at any of the lectures, including tonight's lecture at a later time, uh, simply bring up the UW TV website and you should be able to find most or all of those there available for webcast. So you'll have a chance to go back and revisit anything that you'd like to know more about or like to hear more about or revisit. So um, I think with that, I'll turn to introducing tonight's speaker. Um, we're delighted that Denise Galloway of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center accepted our invitation to come and talk about the work that she has spent 25 years on uh, investigating first papillomavirus and then the use of that basic science knowledge to develop an effective vaccine for papillomavirus caused cervical cancers. And I think as you'll see from Denise's talk, Bringing medical knowledge and basic science knowledge to clinical application involves a lot of hard work. It involves a lot of new knowledge and it involves a certain amount of serendipity to really pull this off in effective fashion. I think the outcome of this, all of you probably know about from the popular press, the vaccine to prevent uh, cervical cancer caused by papillomavirus is one of only two effective anti-cancer vaccines that has ever been developed. And it's the first new one, I believe, in the last 20 years. The first of these was a successful vaccine against hepatitis B virus and its associated uh, viral uh, cancer of the liver. And I should mention that there was important work done in this campus that enabled that vaccine as well. Uh, Denise uh, did her uh, undergraduate and her graduate training at the City College and then the City University of New York. She did her postdoctoral training at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York and then came with her late husband, Jim McDougall, here in 1978 to the Fred Hutchinson to be some of the founding faculty of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, where she has been since that time. And I think she will take you on, uh, in part, a chronological voyage tonight to uh, highlight the different discoveries, first about papillomavirus, about how it causes disease, its links to cervical cancer, and how an understanding of papillomavirus as a virus led to the ability to develop an effective vaccine that you now know is Gardasil uh, and that has been available for about a year and a half, remarkably effective at preventing uh, papillomavirus caused cervical cancer. Uh, since 2000, uh, Denise has been head of the cancer biology program at the Hutch. And I think in recognition for her signal accomplishments in all of these areas, she was awarded what is uh, termed an NIH merit award in 2000 in which she was given in essence 10 years of funding and free reign to do, continue to do the great science that I think you'll hear a bit about tonight. So Denise, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you, Ray, for that very nice introduction. And thank you all for coming. It's great to see uh, so many of you here and to give me the opportunity to really share what has been 
a fantastically exciting 25 years. Um, what you should know is that science is always done by groups of people, not just by one lab, but by many labs. Hundreds of labs throughout the world have contributed to this story. It's not my story. It's the story of the HPV community. But I'm going to share with you um, the little bit that we've contributed and tell you uh, where we are now. So I'm going to cover a few topics in the talk tonight. I'm going to talk about the natural history of, of genital HPV's infections and what is the evidence? How do we know that they're actually involved in cancers? Then I'll talk a little bit about some of the work our lab has done to understand the mechanism. How is it that HPV actually contributes to the development of cancer? And finally, to turn to the development of a vaccine to prevent HPV infection. So let me begin with a historic perspective, talking about cervical cancer around 1950. So at that time, the incidence was very high. About 32 out of 100,000 women would develop cervical cancer. That's as high as, as uh, breast cancer or, other, or prostate cancer are now. But things began to change around the mid-1950s. So Papa Nicolau um, was a scientist or a physician who began looking at, um, at tissues that were taken not only from cervical cancers, but actually from other lesions in women. And he found that he could use cytology to identify cells that were not yet cancers. They were precancers, but if left alone, they would develop into the cancer. And so that really began the first idea that you could screen, that you could catch something before it was a cancer and treat it. Now, we knew what some of the risk factors were for who was likely to get cervical cancer. Having a large number of sex partners, having an early age at first intercourse, having a low socioeconomic status, race and ethnicity, all of these were risk factors. And so that predicted that a cause for cervical cancer could be a sexually transmitted infection. Now, at the time, uh, the leading candidates were herpes simplex virus and chlamydia, a bacterial infection. And the reasons for this were that if you compared people who had cervical cancer with women who didn't, you saw higher levels of, of HSV or of chlamydia. But we didn't really have any molecular tools that enabled us to determine whether these were really present in the cancer, or whether they were causing the cancer. Um, and so the situation was really quite um, poorly defined for uh, in, until the late 70s and early 80s when these tools became available. Now, the person who I think really deserves the credit for pushing the idea that, that human papillomaviruses are in cervical cancer is Harold Zahausen, who was a virologist in Germany. And he had um, taken note of the studies that had been done actually in the 1930s in uh, rabbits and in cows, where, where these rabbits, for example, would develop warts. And after some time, the warts would develop into squamous cell cancers. And when you looked at the cells in those cancers, there was a similarity to the type of cells that you saw in cervical cancer. Now, he knew that this was a virus because you could uh, show that it was very small. It would, uh, was the size of a virus. And so he began to think um, that the same type of virus that was involved in these rabbit cancers might be involved in cervical cancer. So the tools of molecular biology um, were just developing at, at this time. And in fact, the first human papillomavirus, HPV1, was cloned from planter warts. Now, planter warts are these very common warts that you get on the soles of your feet uh, that you usually get when you're a kid. And they never turn into cancers. When he took the DNA from HPV1 and asked, is that DNA present in cervical cancer? The answer was no. So then in the next few years, there were another bunch of um, HPVs that were identified from common skin warts. So all, it turns out that all warts have human papillomaviruses in them, and that there are many different human papillomaviruses. And again, they were disappointed when they took these HPVs and looked for them in cervical cancer. They couldn't find it. 
So the first uh, HPV that was found in a genital tract infection was identified in 1981, and that was HPV-6. And it turns out that this is the major cause of genital warts. About 90% of all genital warts have HPV-6 um, in, in those uh, lesions. But again, this type of, this virus was not present in the cervical cancers. So finally the breakthrough came in, in uh, the mid-1980s when they identified HPV-16. And then when they had that genome in hand and started looking at cervical cancers, about half of them had HPV-16 in them. And very quickly they cloned another one, HPV-18, and about 20% of the cervical cancers that they looked at had HPV-18 DNA in the cancers. So uh, by, by now, we know that there are over 100 different types of HPV that have been fully molecularly cloned and sequenced and characterized, and over 30 of them infect the genital tract. Now these are divided into what are called low-risk types and high-risk types. Now what does that mean? <clears throat> if you were to do these surveys of cervical cancer, and I'll show you one in, in uh, the next slide, what all of the ones that are shown as high-risk types are types that you find in the cervical cancers. By contrast, none of the ones that are considered low-risk are found in the cervical cancers. And so that suggested that there's a different biologic potential between the ones that are considered, that are grouped together, phylogenetically related to each other, uh, that don't have the potential to go on to cause cancer compared to the ones that do. And so they're uh, commonly referred to, and in fact, in the diagnostic test that's used in the, in the clinic these days, you get a diagnosis of either high-risk HPV or low-risk HPV, and that's what that means. You either have one of the types shown in the low-risk or one or more of the types shown in the high-risk group. So there have been large surveys of about 1,000 cervical cancers gathered from sites all over the world and analyzed in a single laboratory for the presence of HPV uh, DNA in those tumors. And this slide makes a couple of points that, that I think are important. First of all, <clears throat> nearly 100% of cervical cancers have HPV DNA in them. And in fact, if you are really very careful about using tissue that has plenty of cancer cells in it, if you have all the types available, if you're sure that it's good DNA that can be amplified in these tests, most people in the field would tell you that 100% of cervical cancers are due to HPV. The second point is that if you, if you look at the orange block, that's HPV-16, and all over the world, HPV-16 is the most common type, and it's about 50% of all, can all cervical cancers have HPV-16 in them. The second most common type that you see is HPV-18, and again, there's some geographic variation with it being common, uh, more common in Asia than it is in Europe, for example, but overall, about 20% of all the cancers, uh, cervical cancers, have HPV-18. Now, of the remaining 30%, um, each one of these other types, each one of these other dozen types that are high risk, each contribute a few percent. So, 70% can be accounted for by two types, but if you were to try to get protection against all the types, you would have to add in these other dozen, dozen types. Now, <clears throat> we wanted to ask the question, whether or not cervical cancer was um, unique in having HPV associated with it, or whether other anogenital cancers were, had HPV associated with it too. And so to do that, we began to collaborate with Janet Daling. She's an epidemiologist over at the Fred Hutch, uh, and some of her colleagues, Margaret Madeline and Steve Schwartz. Now, what these epidemiologists do is the following. They, um, they look in the cancer registry. So anytime there's a cancer, it's reported to a registry, and they're able to access that and identify people who have cancers of a particular type. So we looked initially at cervical cancer, at vulvar cancer, and at anal cancer, and we obtained all the cases that had occurred in Kings, Pierce, and Snohomish counties from 1986 onward. Um, vaginal cancer and penile cancer are more rare, 
And so we had to extend the number of counties to the 13 counties in western Washington. And we had to go back earlier in, in the number of years to get a large enough a number of, uh, of cancer cases. Now we wanted to match that to people who didn't have uh, cancers, the controls. And so this was done by random digit dialing. So for every case, you could look at their, the prefix of their phone number and call someone and see if there's some, a woman in the household in the same age group and see if they would agree to become a control. And so for the controls and the cases, we interviewed them, or Janet and her crew interviewed them. They obtained tissue blocks on the cases and we analyzed them for the presence of HPV DNA. They deter we obtained serum drawn from blood and did serology for the HPV antibodies, a, a test that we developed in the lab. And we were also able to get white blood cells, which we used for some genotyping studies to ask questions about um, the, the cases and controls genetic information. And what did we find? Well, we found um, that, I don't know why that's out of line, we found that all of these cancers that we looked at had HPV in them. Now these numbers are slightly lower than the numbers I showed you on the previous slide, but that's because we had to use fixed tissue, and technically it's a little harder to get DNA out of fixed tissue than fresh tissue. But for cervical cancer, there are two types. The main one is squamous cell cancer, and then there's also adenocarcinoma. Um, as well as vulvar, vaginal, anal, and penile cancer, all of them the majority, the vast majority of them have HPV DNA in the tumors. And as you can see, HPV 16 is the most common type, again, in all of the tumors. And the interesting um, uh, sort of exception to that is adenocarcinoma of the cervix, which has a lot of HPV 18 in it. And this is a finding that has been replicated in many, in many other studies as well. Now, what about other types of cancer? Well, I don't have time to go through all of the negative results, but head and neck cancer was, uh, was an interesting example of a cancer where now several large studies have shown the two types of head and neck cancer, cancer of the oropharynx and cancer of the tonsil, about half of those are due to HPV. And again, it's predominantly HPV 16. And in fact, there are studies now that show that these, that the uh, oropharyngeal and tonsil cancers that are caused by HPV as opposed to those where the risk factors are heavy drinking and smoking actually have different um, patterns. They have different expression patterns and they have different biological outcomes with the HPV related head and neck tumors having a better prognosis than those that don't have HPV in them. And that's an area of active investigation at the present. So we, at the time we started these studies, we really didn't know much about HPV at all. We didn't know how common the infection was, who got it, how long it persisted, all of those sorts of questions. So over the next few slides, I'm going to summarize uh, some, of, some of what we know now and some of the data that, that got us to, to where we are. So what we think happens is that HPV infects cells in the normal cervix and it causes those cells to proliferate and to give changes that appear on a pap smear to be abnormal because now the cells have, are replicating when they shouldn't be replicating. And that type of um, diagnosis can be called atypia or ascus or cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, but it's a low grade lesion. Now the normal outcome of those lesions is that they will regress, almost all of them um, will regress, the body's immune system will be active in, in clearing them. Um, we don't think clearance means getting rid of the virus, but it means controlling the viral infection to a point where uh, it's completely uh, asymptomatic. Now, in some cases, that lesion doesn't resolve and it progresses. And it progresses to a higher grade lesion to what's called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia uh, 2 to 3 or carcinoma in situ or high grade lesions. These lesions are the direct precursors of the cancer. Now even those lesions, some of them may clear, 
but many of them will progress. And of course, you can imagine it's a very difficult question to answer how many of them will progress because you can't leave them untreated since we know so many will progress. And so you have to treat and, and remove these high-grade lesions. So we don't really know the proportion that would normally progress to cancer. But we do know that left untreated, these will now progress and be cancer, which is um, different than the preneoplastic lesions in that there is invasion into the, of the basement membrane, there's growth in the underlying stroma, there can be metastasis to, different, to distant sites. So to begin to address these questions of who gets HPV infection and how long it persists and why it persists in some individuals and to high-grade lesions, we began to collaborate with another epidemiologist who's here at the University of Washington named Laura Kowski. And uh, Laura, uh, and we started what was called the whole health study. Now, maybe some of you have, might even have participated in this study. So the study was that we enrolled women at, who were at the University of Washington. They had to be between the ages of 18 and 20 years old. They had to have finished one uh, quarter of classes at UW. And then they were followed at four monthly intervals for the remaining time that they were in college. And at every uh, exam or at every time point, they were interviewed. They were asked about their sexual history. They had a pelvic exam. Again, we took a swab for HPV DNA. And we took bloods to, for serology for um, HPV antibodies. Now, you'd be interested to know that the mean number of partners in this group was quite low. This was not a, at a, a group who were at high risk for sexually transmitted diseases. The mean number of partners was 1.8. And there was a low prevalence of other sexually transmitted diseases. So for example, herpes simplex type 2, when we assayed for antibodies to HSV2, only about 3% had, had antibodies. Um, there were very low rates of chlamydia, no gonorrhea, no syphilis. But among the women who were sexually active in this study, after follow-up for 24 months, the prevalence of HPV D DNA in the genital tract was nearly 40%. So HPV is an extremely common infection among young sexually active women. So here's another way that I like to think about the natural history of HPV. So shown here is a, is a lifeline. And um, around the time of birth, there, there can be transmission of HPV. There is a disease called laryngeal papillomatosis, which uh, is an HPV infection in the larynx of newborns that occurs from passing through a, an infected birth uh, uh, tract. But it's very, very rare, about 1 in 200,000 births. We don't really see any evidence for uh, transmission of genital HPVs by any other means, by any other perinatal infections or childhood infections. But once someone becomes, a woman becomes sexually active, as I said, everything changes. And the prevalence of HPV infection is extremely high. In this study, around, uh, around 40%. Now, you probably also read in the newspapers within the last few weeks that national studies have been done looking at the prevalence of, of uh, sexually transmitted diseases in, in uh, young teenagers and young women, and that 25% had some HPV or had some uh, sexually transmitted infection, well, I can tell you that that's a big underestimate because it's only looking at a single time point, and that if you look over time, you're going to see a lot more HPV. Now, once a woman becomes sexually active, the median time from, from having a new partner until the detection of HPV infection was on the order of six months to a year. And similarly, the appearance of these early lesions of CIN and the low-grade SIL lesions was very quick. Within about uh, two years of HPV infection, we saw the appearance of these lesions. Now again, how often do they occur is a very difficult question to answer. And I think it's difficult to answer because um, it depends really on how often you look. So you can imagine that if you looked once every three years, many of the infections would have come and they would have been resolved. If you looked every one year, you'd find more. 
If you look every four months, we have relatively high rates compared to some studies. But what if you looked every month or every week? You might find that there were really high rates of, of these abnormal CIN lesions, but mostly they resolve. So it's really a question of catching them. Now, these high-grade lesions that I described, the prevalent carcinoma in situ, the median age in the United States is, is 29 years of age. And the median age for invasive cervical cancer in the United States is 49 years of age. So that means that <clears throat> there's approximately three decades from the time of infection to the time of development of cancer. So there's a couple of points to be made about that. First of all, it explains why pap smear screening works, because it's a very slow process to go from infection to the development of cancer. So you, can, you have a long time in which you can catch these preneoplastic lesions. Secondly, it says that infection per se is not what causes cancer, but there are things that accumulate over time that are important in the development of cancer. And we'll talk about what that means in, a, in just a minute. But the acute infection does not give you cancer. It gives you the appearance of HPV infection, which is abnormal cells, most of which resolve. And only occasionally do you get all the other changes that lead to cancer. So looking in more detail at the early steps uh, of infection, which we were able to do in the, in the studies, um, we learned the following. But again, I told you from the time of, of first having a partner until infection, the median time is about six months. Then we detect HPV DNA. And if we follow a particular HPV type, on average, we saw that the DNA persisted for 8 to 12 months. And then it usually resolved and went to undetectable levels. We also saw that antibodies to the, that specific HPV type developed. And again, the median time for development of those antibodies was about a year. Now, that's actually very slow to develop an antibody response in comparison to many other virus infections. And the reason is that, is that this virus simply remains in the cervical epithelium. It doesn't get out into the bloodstream like many viruses do. And so it doesn't really come into contact with the immune system. It's evolved a very good strategy of just hiding out where the immune system doesn't, doesn't, go very, doesn't see it very well. And so antibodies are very slow to develop. T cell responses develop also. They've been difficult to measure and characterize because they're at a very, very low level. But from many sorts of types of evidence, we know that the development of a T cell response is crucial in this clearance of HPV infection. And it's the T cell response, not the antibodies, that are critical in, in having regression of the lesions and clearance of the virus. So <clears throat> what are the risk factors? Why do some people progress to getting cancer, whereas most people will clear the infection? So we know that having a persistent infection is, is, um, is a risk factor. That is, if you do these pap smears and you continually detect HPV, high-risk HPV DNA, those women are at greatest risk for developing a cancer. The immune system is also very, very important. Immunosuppression by any means, HIV infection, chronic immunosuppressive therapy after transplantation, chemotherapy, any of those cause an increase in HPV uh, detection or infection. So the immune system is keeping HPV in, intact. We know that individuals who have certain HLA alleles are at greater risk than others. Um, having a, a, a particular type of T cell response where you get a high interferon gamma and low IL-4 and IL-10 is also a, a bad sign, a sign that you may uh, progress. And interestingly, current smoking is a uh, a very strong risk factor for all of these anogenital cancers. And we think that, in fact, current smoking here is working like an immunosuppressive agent because it's been shown that the immune cells that are present in the cervical epithelium, the Langerhans cells, are depleted uh, in women who smoke. 
Independently of HPV, we know that infection with other sexually transmitted agents increases your risk. Probably it creates a, a pro, um, pro proliferative response and a pro inflammatory response that um, causes signaling that allows the cells to progress. And there have been some studies that show that there is a familial association and the genes that are responsible for that um, have not been mapped. Now clearly though, the most important risk factor is the failure to be screened. And I like to show this uh, piece of data that comes from the Nordic countries. And it looks at four different countries here. And you can focus, for example, on the green line, which is Norway, and the red line, which is Finland. And around the, the mid to late 1950s, Finland instituted a very aggressive policy of screening, whereas Norway and the other countries didn't. And you can look at the decline in the rates of cancer that you see in Finland in comparison with the other countries that did not put good screening programs into place. So screening is clearly the most important factor in uh, eliminating cervical cancer at, this, at that time. Now again, another way of looking at that is if you look at the incidence of cervical can cancer by country, you can see if you look at the dark areas or the gray areas, you see that they have approximately a tenfold, eight to tenfold higher rates of cervical cancer than the lighter areas on this map of the world. Now, in fact, if you were to superimpose on this map the dollars spent on health care, it would look exactly the same, that countries that don't have money to do, to do cervical cancer screening have very high rates of cervical cancer, rates that are like the ones we had in the 1950s before we instituted screening. So I want to talk very briefly about the mechanisms by which HPVs contribute to cancer. What do these HPVs do that causes cancer? <clears throat> so this is the viral genome. It's a very simple virus, um, much simpler than many of the other viruses you may be familiar with, like HIV or, um, or herpes simplex virus. This only has eight genes in it. And there are a bunch of them, the E1, 2, 4, and 5, that are involved in the transcriptional regulation and, and replication of the virus. Um, there's a non-coding region <clears throat> that has all of the cis-acting sequences necessary for transcription and replication. But the two sets of genes I'm going to talk about, one in this section and one in the next, are the viral oncogenes and the capsid genes. Now the viral oncogenes are considered to be oncogenes for two reasons. First of all, if you look in these cervical cancers, it's not simply that the DNA is there. It's that the E6 and E7 genes are always transcribed. They're always made into, into RNA and always made into protein products that drive the replication of that cancer. So in fact, I, should, I had outside a cervical cancer cell line, HeLa cells, that have been around in culture for 40 years that, that have HPV 18, E6, and E7 expressed in them. And if you were to take that cell line and shut off by molecular tricks, shut off the expression of E6 and E7, the cell line would stop growing. So it's dependent on the continued expression of E6 and E7. And secondly, we can take E6 and E7 from normal and put it into normal cells. Those normal cells would normally only go for about 100 divisions and then they would stop. But if you put E6 and E7 in them from the high risk types but not from the low risk types, they proliferate indefinitely. You can grow those cell lines forever. So these genes have the power to immortalize cells and culture and to drive the proliferation of the cancer. Now, <clears throat> when HPV infects a cell, the genome remains as an episome, as a circle. And one of the consequences of that is that you have a low level of expression of E6 and E7. And one of the things that happens during progression in these high-grade lesions is that you get integration of the HPV genome into the host cell genome. And one of the consequences of that through various mechanisms is that you get a high level of expression of E6 and E7. And so we think that that's a change that has to occur. You have to ramp up the level of expression of E6 and E7 in the tumors. Now what are the targets of these um, oncoproteins? Well, one of the 
key regulators of cellular proliferation are, um, is the retinoblastoma, or RB protein. This is responsible for regulating a whole set of genes that you need to get cells into S phase. S phase is, is um, the part of the cell cycle where cells replicate their DNA. And the E7 protein binds to the RB protein, and it actually targets it for degradation so that the RB protein is no longer there. It's no longer able to act as a break that keeps cells in the G1 phase of the cell cycle and prevents them from going into S phase. So you've eliminated the break. Cells that are expressing the high-risk E7 proteins just continue to go into S phase. They continue to replicate and to divide, even when their signal's telling it that it shouldn't do so, because they no longer have the RB protein. <coughs> the E6 protein does many different things. One of them is targeting the P53, another critical tumor suppressor for degradation. So you not only eliminate um, P53, but you eliminate proteins that are involved in regulating the uh, shape and polarity of epithelial cells. <coughs> you eliminate proteins that are necessary for the cell to, go, to undergo an apoptotic response. And you turn on telomerase. So I told you that if you take E6 and E7 and you put them into normal cells, um, they, the cells will be able to replicate indefinitely. And the reason that that is the case is because they now have the telomerase gene, which allows cells to replicate um, without having any problems for indefinitely. So taken together, what E6 and E7 is doing is, is they're promoting this entry into S phase. They're causing the replications to be abnormal through duplication of the centrosomes. They're eliminating P53, which normally regulates a whole bunch of checkpoints that assure that the cell faithfully replicates and segregates its chromosomes. It blocks apoptosis. It disturbs epithelial polarity and confers immortality. Now, what's the result of all of those activities? is that the cells become very genetically unstable. So they're having lots of changes that are occurring, and they have no mechanism to stop proliferating or to undergo a programmed cell death in response to those deleterious changes. And so they just randomly accumulate changes that may lead to the development of cancer. Now, cancer is a very rare event. But if you get the right collection of these changes that allow the cancer cells to grow and to form, then, then you have cancer. And so what HPV is really doing is setting the stage by causing all of this genetic instability. And it also explains why it takes such a long time from the time that you're infected until the time that the cancer develops. Because it's really a rather random process that these changes might be the right constellation of changes that you need for cancer. So in the last part of the talk, I want to turn to the development of a vaccine to prevent HPV infection. So when you think about strategies for HPV um, vaccination, you can really think of three points in this natural history that you might be able to attack. The first is to prevent infection. The second is to do some type of immunotherapy where you mediate regression, where you cause those abnormal cells to be eliminated. Or once you already have cancer, in addition to surgery and uh, radiation or chemotherapy, you might be able to find and eliminate any residual cancer cells that are existing. Now those last two targets are actively being worked on by a number of different laboratories and companies, um, but there aren't any clear uh, winners of this yet. And so what I'm going to talk about is the vaccine that's been developed to prevent infection. So in, in the summer of 2006, the FDA approved the vaccine um, made by Merck that's called Gardasil that prevents HPV infection and, as they say, will um, guard against cancer and genital warts. And we'll, we'll explain how that works. <clears throat> so the basis for the vaccine um, is the capsid proteins of the virus. So there's a major capsid protein called L1, 
and a minor protein called L2. Now this is a, a, a cryo-electron micrograph of the HPV virus. And everything that you can see here is, is HPV1, it, sorry, is, is the L1 protein. And so these star-like projections are five molecules of L1 that come together to form a capsimer. And 72 of those come together to form the viral coat. You can't see the L2 protein. It sort of sticks in these little holes and goes down to the inside of the, of the uh, virus. And inside of that is where the viral uh, DNA is. Now, um, this shows what one of those star-like capsimers uh, are. And the point that I want to make here is the, the red color indicates amino acids that are unique to a particular HPV type. And the blue ones are the ones that are conserved among all of the different HPVs. And what this means is that the surface that is seen by the immune system is very type specific. So your immune system, when it sees that, it says, ah, oh, it's HPV 16. It makes an immune response that's only against HPV 16 and not against HPV 18 or any of those other HPV types that I showed you because it's seeing type-specific residues on the, on the surface of the capsimer. This looks at the capsimer in a little more detail, and in fact, there are actual loops that are present that, again, each one of these colored loops are type-specific changes that are present only for a given HPV type. So the success of making the vaccine came from the fact that you can make a virus-like particle that looks just like the real virus that only has the L1 protein in it. So if you express the L1 protein in the lab, the sort of things we do all the time, as soon as you express that L1 protein, five of them come together automatically to form a capsimer. And then without really doing anything else, 72 of those come together and they form this virus-like particle. And, and you see the structure on the, on the right looks just like the real virus that you saw on the previous slide. Only this has no viral DNA in it, so it's not infectious. It can't cause cancer. It can't cause disease. It only has the L1 protein. But to the immune system, it looks just like real virus. And so you're going to make a response that's the same as if you had a real infection. Now, how do we know that that works? Well, there were studies that were done in animals initially to, um, to show that that works. So you could make, each one of these animals has its own papillomavirus. They're not called HPVs, but they're called something that relates to the animal, like cottontail rabbit or canine oral or bovine uh, papillomavirus. And if you make the virus-like particle for each one of those viruses, and vaccinate the animals, you can show that, all, that if you take the serum from these animals and transfer it to new animals, you can protect them against infection. So that said that all you needed to do was vaccinate with these virus-like particles. The animals would make an antibody, and the antibody was sufficient to confer protection against the respective papillomavirus. So how does it work? Um, at, at a uh, cellular level. Well, again, when you uh, vaccinate with a virus-like particle, you stimulate a B cell response. The B cells make antibodies. They, they turn into plasma cells that make antibodies. And the antibodies recognize the virus, and they bind to it before the virus is able to infect the cervical epithelial cell. So the virus um, that's currently approved is Gardasil, and it has four HPV types in it, four, four virus-like particles in it. It has HPV 6 and 11, which I said are the major types that cause genital warts and laryngeal warts. And it has HPV 16 and 18, which are, account for 70% of all cervical cancers. It's made by expressing the protein in, in yeast, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, again, you get this assembly of the L1 proteins. You purify them and mix them with an adjuvant that makes it uh, more active to the immune system. And, and then it, you give a dose that contains 
all four of those virus-like particles mixed together. Now, does it work? So here's some data. There was lots of data that had to be given to the FDA to convince them that, that this would, should work. But here is just one piece of data. So this, these are um, clinical trials, which are both the recipients and the people who are giving the vaccine don't know who's getting the vaccine and who gets a placebo. And if you compare these early lesions that I talked to you about, the CIN1, 2, or 3, um, or adenocarcinoma in situ, among the people who received the placebo, 83 developed disease and only four developed it that received the vaccine. So 95% of people, um, there was a 95% efficacy. If you look at genital warts, um, again, 91 developed genital warts compared to one that received the vaccine. So the vaccine in many different clinical trials has been shown to be extremely efficacious in preventing these early stages of disease and genital warts. Now, <clears throat> As you realize, as I told you, cervical cancer takes uh, 30 years to develop on average, uh, in the meantime. And so these, these trials can't look at protection against cervical cancer, or it will take a very long time to ask whether we're making a difference in preventing cervical cancer. But clearly, the fact that we prevent the preneoplastic lesions is almost certainly means that you, we're going to prevent the cancer as well. So is this the end of the story? Um, well, there are certainly future things that have to be done. Uh, as I mentioned, there are all these other HPV types, and we have to increase the vaccine, has to increase the coverage of the oncogenic types, which can be done by putting in more different types of VLPs or by developing um, other strategies where there might be some cross protection. What about the duration of protection? These trials have only been going on for about five years. And so we know that over a five-year period, there's excellent uh, levels of protection. But if we're going to vaccinate before women become sexually active, um, and the recommendation for this vaccine is starting at nine, and yet we want to protect into the 30s, 40s, or 50s, is the coverage going to last that long? We don't know yet, because the trials haven't been going on that long. Now, in countries like the United States, that may not be such a problem. Many, many vaccines get boosters, um, and so it would be possible to boost uh, if, if the vaccine protection is seen to wane. Now, someone in the audience is always going to ask, well, what about men? What about boys? Should we be vaccinating males? And I'll leave that as a topic for um, one of the questions. I'm sure someone will want to ask that, whether or not we should be vaccinating males. Now, the other thing that I think is really important is the cost and availability to the developing world. As you, as you saw on the map that I showed, uh, showed you, cervical cancer is an extraordinary problem in poor parts of the world that can't afford screening. The vaccine um, it is quite expensive. It's $120 a dose in the United States, and it's a three-shot regimen. And so that's way out of the league of developing countries. Um, there are many avenues for, uh, for WHO and other organizations to buy vaccines that reduce rates. But even at, that, even at that, it's going to be very expensive. And you're competing in the developing world for all sorts of other pressing health care needs, antiretroviral treatment for HIV, treatments for malaria and, and, uh, and tuberculosis. Um, and so where the HPV vaccine is going to fit into their health priorities, uh, has yet to be determined. So there's plenty of work um, yet to do, which is great because there's so many young people in the audience. You'll all have interesting things to work on if you go into science. Um, my lab and Jim McDougall's lab have worked together on this for a very long time. And this just briefly mentioned some of the people who I can't thank individually, but have really done a tremendous job in working on this. Um, and then there are people that I uh, must acknowledge. Laura Kautsky, who's been involved in the, in the studies here at the university, at the Hall Health Natural History Studies, and all of her colleagues. Janet Daling and her colleagues at the Hutchinson Center, who've done the anogenital case control studies. Um, many different colleagues that I've 
been fortunate enough to work with at the Hutch and the University of Washington. I've gotten reagents from a number of other institutions. Um, Marcy Wright is my administrator who is invaluable. NCI and NIAID have paid for a lot of the work that I talked about. And Jim McDougall um, was a great collaborator in all these studies. So with that, I'm going to stop.